Today is going to be a lesson. The name of our lesson is how many possible answers slash responses are there to a binary question. In this lesson, we will be exploring the nature of binary questions and how they relate to debate. What is a binary question? It is a question that has typically two expected responses, yes or no, true or false. However, just because the question implies one of two answers, there are multiple ways to combine two answers and should be considered. Now, you might be asking why the title is answers slash responses instead of just answers. This is because answers are a response to a binary question, but not all responses are answers. Specifically, there are seven true answers that are responses and three non-answers that are responses. Let us begin with the obvious. Number one. Yes. Example number one. Do I exist? For the most part, this question's answer will always be yes. It is impossible for someone to ask this question and not exist. Therefore, the answer is always yes. The famous proof of this particular answer is, I think, therefore I am. Of course, the man who came up with this proof then went on to try to prove the existence of God. He failed. But his original proof is quite true, at least in this circumstance. All your senses could be corrupted. You could be a brain floating in a jar. But the one thing they can't fool your senses about is the fact that you are indeed thinking. This is proof of an objective universe. If you are thinking and accept the possibility that there are other thinking beings, then there must be an objective universe for everyone to exist in. This is an important proof for those who think that everything is a social construct, which it would in fact state that everything is subjective. When fighting against someone who takes up such an absolutist position, proving the existence of an objective universe disproves that everything is a social construct. There must be an underlying base state where reality exists objectively outside our perception. Therefore, the universe has limitations of what can and cannot be. Since the human mind is not constrained by reality and can think of almost anything, we can want things to be a certain way all we want, but often objective reality will have something to say about it. Number two, no. Example number two, do you want to die? For the most part, most people want to live. This is an example of a question where you are trying to establish some sort of agreement on a given subject. Do you want to die? Most people will say no. If they say yes, then chances are your debate will then take an unexpected turn. You might wonder, why not use the more positive example of, do you want to live? That is a judgment call on behalf of the person arguing. In an argument where you are attacking someone, you will want to use negative questions to force a negative response. This is a subtle form of attack. Sometimes you will want to change it up, switching from positive to negative in an attempt to wear someone down by basically using a push-pull method if you wish to destroy an idea that exists in their head. Questions with negative answers will help to subtly undermine that idea. If the person you are talking with simply does not trust you, then you should avoid questions that will always get a negative response. That said, sometimes you need to ask a question for the purpose of getting information. Know the difference between an argument building question and an information gathering question. Information gathering questions should be framed in a binary format, but do try to make them as neutral as possible so as to get an honest response. It is best to avoid any other response other than yes or no. We shall now proceed to the responses that are not strictly yes or no. Answer number three, yes and no. Example three, is the sky blue? Now you might think the answer is yes, but the sky at night is black. At sunset and sunrise, the skies may be different colors as well. The sky may be gray due to it being overcast from cloud conditions. Technically, it has no color at all, and the only color we see is the light spectrum being shifted as it passes through the air. The correct answer is yes and no. The question is simply not specific enough, 
So if someone tries to use, is the sky blue, in an attempt to indicate that their argument is so fundamentally true, that their statements must be true, as the sky being blue, then you can derail their argument by going into minute details and explaining, well, that depends. What time of day is it? What are the weather conditions? Where am I standing when I look at the sky? Part of the sky could be blue, and part could be red, and part could be black, depending on how close the sun is to the horizon. I'm afraid your answer is both yes and no. Now the typical response is to say, well, usually it's blue. Then you counter, but you ex have to accept that there are exceptions, just like there are many exceptions to your argument. Answer number four. Neither yes nor no. Example four. Have you stopped raping little boys? This is a classic trap question. The question itself comes with assumptions that are untrue. You pin down someone, making them think they have to answer yes or no. However, in this case, neither answer can be correct. If you say no, what you're stating is, I'm still raping little boys. If you say yes, you are then stating, I used to rape little boys, but I am no longer performing that action. Sometimes it results in someone making a mistake and saying something that could be twisted and used against them. If the interrogated subject is a clear-thinking person, they will become flustered and sputtered, trying to dismiss the very question itself. Typically, during this moment of confusion, the attacker will then move on to another question. The goal is always to just rattle their cage and derail the conversation. This is a form of meta-argument. When you are trying to take the conversation and twist it to a topic of your liking, it's best to try to derail the conversation briefly before doing so. Meta-arguing is unfortunately a sign of weakness. There are a few ways to handle this. The first way to handle someone trying to meta-argue would be to accept the offer of meta-arguing. You may be in a weak position yourself. You may want some breathing room, in which case allow the conversation to be derailed and run with it. However, if you're going to do this, make sure to go even further. Do not allow a controlled derailment. You don't want him to change tracks. You want the train to jump the tracks completely. If you allow him to perform a controlled change to meta-arguing, he more than likely has a plan to then bring the conversation back around to a topic he is in a stronger position to defend. As the old saying goes, if everyone around you is slipping under the waters of madness, dive. The second method of dealing with meta-arguing is to call him out. In other words, flat out accuse him of meta-arguing. State that he is trying to change the topic by arguing about how you are arguing. How dare he ask such a biased and inflammatory question. This is a sign of a poor mind and poor thinking. Done correctly, he will instead sputter at your accusation. But do not allow him to explain or excuse himself. Instead, simply state loudly, irrelevant, back to the topic, back to the topic, back to the topic. But do not allow him to speak or respond to your accusations. Simply make requests to go back to the main topic. This can be a dangerous gambit and not one for an amateur. If you are not used to meta, meta argument gambit, practice it in arguments where the stakes are low. Done poorly, you can come across as a complete asshole to your audience. Remember, in most arguments, you aren't trying to convince your opponent. You are trying to sway witnesses to your side of the argument. You can lose the argument, but win the audience. Since this is all about hearts and minds, in most cases, not facts and figures. Remember where your true goals are at all times. The third option of dealing with meta-arguing is to simply decline the offer, rather than calling them out. If someone is trying to use a leading question attack on you, the standard counter is as follows. Your question assumes many untruths. The only real answer to your question is neither yes nor no, because your question is based on faulty premises. Practice this response. For it to be most effective, you need to rattle it off without thinking. Done correctly, it will make you appear to be a clear-minded and deep thinker who realizes a trap when he saw one. It will earn you points with your audience. However, not as many as if you successfully called him out for attempting to meta-argue. 
Calling him out on a question that is based on a false assumption is just par for the course. Number five, yes or no. Example number five. Do you want to get Chinese food for dinner? Yes or no does not come up very often as an answer. Usually it is used in questions where someone is asking you for your opinion or desires and you don't really have any. An alternative answer is, I don't care. By stating yes or no or any variant thereof, you are indicating that either answer is correct. It also can be used when you are uncertain of the outcome, but you know that it will be either yes or no. Will Bob show up for the play? To which you reply, well, if he isn't here by 8, then I guess he's not coming. In many ways, this is like the next answer, but it does narrow down the possible outcomes. Often this comes up when you want to add clarifiers to your question or answer, and when the situation has been simply too vague. This is different from yes and no, in that yes and no can be both answers at the same time. Part of the sky is blue, and part of the sky is red. If the answer to the question could be in multiple states of being at the same time, then use yes and no. If the answer cannot be in multiple states, you eat Chinese food or you don't, then the answer to give is yes or no. Another way of looking at it is when people use the phrase is usually or mostly or sometimes or rarely. What they are really saying is some variant of yes or no, except they are giving you an estimation of how often it's yes and how often it's no. Do not confuse this with never or always. Those answers might sound like they fall under degrees of instance qualifiers, but they really are just no and yes, respectfully. Number six, maybe including one of the previous five answers. Example number six, does Frank have cancer? We may have an idea Frank has cancer. We may have a good idea what the answer is, but we aren't sure. We are informed enough to take a guess, and so you have the answer maybe. Maybe must include one of the previous answers. You must state something like maybe yes or maybe no. In terms of argument, using maybe is a sign of weakness. Maybe also includes any statement that has a qualifier like in my opinion or what I think is or I feel like. You should avoid using maybe statements when you can, but sometimes that is the true situation. You are fairly sure that X is the answer but you can't claim it with absolute accuracy. In this case, it's best to make some sort of maybe statement as an answer and deal with the consequences. There are advantages to saying maybe over yes or no, however. It gives you some wiggle room to backpedal later. It gives you the chance to state, look, I was uncertain of the answer, but knowing everything I knew, I gave the best answer I could. You lose points in a debate with your audience every time you use maybe, but you will lose points more if you make a flat-out incorrect statement. Being wishy-washy is far better than being wrong. Note, do not confuse this with degrees of instance qualifiers from the previous answer. Maybe doesn't deal in a spectrum. You can say maybe yes or no and include degrees of instance qualifiers. But maybe is always a preference. It is a gut response. It is a hunch. It is intuition. In arguments, you should avoid using this because it is a weak spot that can be attacked. However, that said, if your opponent is using maybe X type statements, either attack it immediately or make note of its use and then bring it up later when you need to attack the very underpinnings of his position. Answer number seven. I don't know. Example seven. Who built this house? Sometimes you are asked a question, you just flat out have no idea what the answer is. It is human nature in a debate to want to at least appear like you know what you are doing. Admitting a lack of knowledge is dangerous in a debate. Being wrong is worse. There are a number of strategies in dealing with ignorance. The first example. Never say it. When in doubt, fake it till you make it. Use words like maybe and guess. Better to take a guess than to admit ignorance. However, if you make too many guesses and are proven wrong too many times, your audience will lose faith in you. You need to build their faith, trust, and respect. This only works if you are really good at thinking on your feet. Second, say it often. This tactic requires that you admit you don't know the answer all that often. 
What I mean is, you need to pretend you don't know the answer to safe questions as much as possible. By admitting a lack of knowledge, but doing it in a manner that implies that it's no big deal, you give your audience the impression that when you don't know something, you'll confess rather than bluff. That means that when you do bluff later, they are more likely to believe you. Ironically, by showing that you are flawed, you gain trust. However, it must be done smoothly, done too often or with too many pauses. The opponent may then switch to meta-arguing, pointing out how little you know. The third option is counterattack. If you're attempting this strategy, you must simply admit you don't know if you don't know. However, when you have to admit you don't know, you must immediately attack your opponent. If they know the answer, you must ask them for it. If your opponent is fishing for information rather than asking a question he already knows what the answer is, this method can work well. By turning the tables on him, a good example would be in the movie I, Robot, during the interrogation scene between Will Smith and the robot. Will Smith asked, Can a robot make a beautiful painting? Whereupon the robot asked, Can you? Will Smith was then shut down and had to change tactics. Uh, the fourth and final option is to simply suck it up. Just admit it when it comes up and deal with it. However, do so with humility and grace. Then ask your opponent to explain it to you. Since he asked you a question you did not know, ask him to educate you. While in some regards this will earn him points with the audience, it will also show the audience that you are open to new ideas and wish to learn. Also, but encouraging, you may get your target to give you new information to use against him later. It goes without saying, you need to avoid stating I don't know. We want to be the ones educating our opponents, not the other way around. However, if they seem a bit too eager to learn, then they are most likely fishing and hoping that you will make a statement that they in turn can use against you later. Keep it simple and direct. Avoid lengthy diatribes and no matter how much you like discussing the topic, try not to ramble too much. At this point, we are done with the seven true answers and moving on to the three responses that are not answers. The first non-answer response would be silence. Example number eight. Silence is a powerful response, but is not in and of itself an answer. It can indicate contempt or make you look like an idiot. Be careful when using silence as a response to binary questions. However, maybe you are just thinking. So, there are four schools of thought regarding the use of silence in an argument slash debate. The first is, think about it. State clearly, interesting, let me think about that. Then shut up. Make no sound actually think about it. Defocus from your opponent and actually think about the topic. If he tries to talk, cut him off and state clearly, excuse me, do you want me to accept your position? You have made a valid point and I want to consider the possibilities. Stop trying to rush me. If your opponent continues to pressure you, then you can dismiss his arguments by stating, if you're trying to rush me, then clearly you're just trying to fast talk me. I will not fall for any argument that involves a non-stop blizzard of bullshit. The second option is to mutter. Muttering is a dangerous tactic because it allows your opponent to know that you are thinking. However, it also allows your audience to know what you're thinking. To properly mutter, you need to argue both sides of the argument out loud, but clearly you are talking to yourself. If possible, look away and make hand gestures a lot. Done correctly, you can jump around a lot and have a tiny little monologue while bringing up any point you want to. However, you must eventually make some sort of logical statement and come to a conclusion. So eventually, you will need to answer the question. This isn't really silence per se, uh, but a variant thereof where you're not really answering the question. Difficult to pull off, but done correctly can be inspiring. The third option would be stalling. In this case, you indicate that you're thinking, but you already know that you're what you're going to say. In this case, never mutter. Just remain quiet and keep stating that you're thinking for as long as you think you can before you start to look like an idiot. The goal is to stall just long enough that your opponent is about to get pissed off. You want to cut them off and give them an answer. 
To the untrained audience, this may look like your opponent is aggressive and emotional. To most debaters, this tactic will stand out like a sore thumb and lose you points because it's a cheap shot and a form of meta-argument. You aren't attacking the topic, you are attempting to psychologically undermine your opponent. Use it sparingly. And the fourth and final option would be to ignore your opponent. This is where you simply say nothing and just glare. You ignored the question entirely. If it was a good question, it will cost you. If it was an insulting question like, have you stopped raping little children? Silence may be your best response. By being silent, you give your audience time to contemplate exactly how insulting the question was. However, if your opponent insists on a given question being answered, ignoring the question may end the debate. Refusing to answer a question is a form of silence. If you refuse to answer a question, your opponent can then declare the debate over. Who wins and who loses at that point would be entirely dependent on your audience. The second non-answer would be non-sequitur. Example 9. Does the wage gap exist? Sometimes you are asked a difficult question that you simply don't know the answer to. Or perhaps you don't want to answer. A difficult maneuver is the non-sequitur. It is the response that is not an answer. In fact, it has nothing to do with the question at all. There are five basic versions. The first version. The topic changer. This is where you attempt to change the topic before you answer the question, usually done by bringing up something emotionally charged. For example, well, you can't ask that question without considering that all men are rapists and that every act of sex is rape. That has absolutely nothing to do with most questions. But you'd be hard-pressed not to have somebody shout in your face, what the hell are you talking about? Topic changed. Its use is a desperate act because it usually is used when whatever topic you need to change it to is probably going to wind up a worse situation than what you were in. Use it with great caution. If this is used on you, weigh your options and determine if you want to allow the change of topics because it may be advantageous of you to allow it to happen. The second option is smooth jazz. The smooth jazz non sequitur is where you never really answer the question, but you give a smooth and flowing answer that says absolutely nothing. It sounds like you answered the question, but you really didn't. For example, the wage gap is a very charged topic. There are many people who are concerned about it, and regardless of the data, it does affect people. The very topic is what we are talking about, and it's important to keep it in mind so that we can properly understand all of the nuances. In the end, we are both trying to help people, and I think we can both agree on that. I just said absolutely nothing. I didn't answer the question at all. Yet, if I had done it correctly, you can read whatever you want into my answer and feel good about yourself. The third option is intimidation. This requires you to explode and be horribly offended. This is a popular tactic of passive-aggressive individuals. The goal is to become so irrationally obsessed with emotions that it completely overwhelms your opponent and they instead shift to attempts to placate you and thus avoid the forbidden topic. If someone tries this on you, it is a sign of weakness. Press on. Do not be intimidated by their anger. However, if you feel you must use this on your opponent, at least do it right. Do not yell. Instead, tense up. Struggle to say every word as if you were barely in control of yourself. You should never say anything hateful, nor make threats. Instead, your body language and tone of voice should carry all of your outrage. Ramble on about some personal problem or slight. For example, my belief symbol on the wage gap are dependent on how I got to watch my mother waste away because my father cheated on her and left us. Mom had cancer. Dad just thought she was too much of an emotional drain and wouldn't stand by her anymore. The whole time, you must carefully enunciate every syllable. You should tense up your shoulders. Make strange and randomly quick movements with your hands. Tilt your head slowly at odd angles. Widen your eyes to show all the white around them. Don't frown. Instead, work to force a tense smile. If you can, flare your nostrils and periodically raise your eyebrows up high on your forehead. 
then abruptly tilt your head forward, bringing them down as close to your eyes as possible. Look up at your opponent through your eyelashes while squinting with suspicion and contempt. Keep changing up your body language as much as possible, preferably at random, and act in a fashion as if you are on the brink of murdering everyone in the room. Act like you can only keep so much of yourself under control. You keep a normal looking face, but your shoulders betray your anger. You force your shoulders to relax, then you clench your jaw and bare your teeth in a silent snarl. However, it is absolutely important that you never say anything threatening. In a court of law, body language is not admissible. Everything you say must be polite. Trust me, looking like you are a powder keg about to explode, but never exploding as you say impossibly polite words, is a thousand times more intimidating than exploding into a fiery rage. The fourth option is called the fish mouth. Now, if you don't know what a Malkavian is, it's from a game where you pretend to be a vampire. One of the types of vampires was the Malkavian. They are all insane, which is why people like to play the character. Some people do it subtly and they come across as quite dangerous. Then there is the fish mouth. So called because when the Malkavian is playing his character and pretending to be insane, he'll do something completely at random, like shout, fish. The fish mouth is difficult to pull off and usually makes you look like an idiot. However, if you do it well, you might gain some points. You need to keep your audience laughing, basically. You can't just shout, kneecap rhubarb, rip a dog's head off, the way age gap is like rain jumping out of a tin dog, but greener. The fish mouth is usually looked down upon with disdain. If you choose to play the fool, do it well. If you can get people to laugh while you avoid answering the question, people may forget you've never actually answered the question. For example, that reminds me, how does a gay horse ask for food? Hey! Being funny is great if you can pull it off on the fly. Avoid looking petty or mean. When in doubt, insult yourself. The pay gap? Well, it couldn't possibly be any wider than this gap in my front teeth. Have you seen this? Ugh, I should have gotten braces when I was a kid. I'm such an ugly loser. Again, avoid going too far or you'll look like you're just fishing for sympathy. If you encounter a fish milk, avoid calling them on it. At best, you'll get them to stop. At worst, you'll look like you're attacking them. It's best just to focus on redirecting them back to the question and do not let them not answer you. Simply state, you are avoiding my question. Please answer it. Option five is clarification. I'd be happy to answer your question, but first, what is wage and how do you define gap? Which parties are to be included in these parameters? And what about etc. 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 Asking question after question, trying to attack the very question itself, sometimes you do need clarification. However, sometimes it's simply a stalling tactic. If someone is using this on you, focus them back to the original question. Avoid using clarification as a stalling tactic because it allows your opponent to restate his position, thus reaffirming the ideas that he has inside your audience's minds. And in a worst case scenario, it can make you look ignorant. Finally, there is also the use of the counter question. A counter question is different from clarification in so much as you are going on the attack. For example, why do you think there isn't a wage gap? This is often countered simply saying, I asked you a question, please answer my question before we move on to yours. Sometimes the counter question is a combination of any of the previous non sequiturs. The simple fact is a question is never a statement. Answers are always statements. Anyone who replies to your question with a question is not providing an answer. Unlike clarification, however, you don't really care whether or not your question ever gets an answer. That's the point of the counter question. It's simply to undermine your opponent. And finally, we must consider the final non-answer. Lies. Example number 10. Are you an alien from another world? If you answer yes, you are lying or delusional. It is sometimes difficult to determine when somebody is merely mistaken and when somebody is deliberately attempting to mislead you. Unfortunately, you can't just accuse someone of lying. You need to catch them with proof. They have to have shown they knew the truth in the past or reveal that they know the truth later. 
Never accuse someone of lying unless you have some sort of proof to back up the accusation. It goes without saying, never lie. However, you can be deceptive. All of your statements must be technically true. I said he was a gay activist. He is gay. He is an activist. You just assumed he was a gay rights activist. Or they must be true in spirit. For example, you are dumb as a box of rocks. Technically, a box of rocks is not intelligent, so anyone who can talk is smarter than a box of rocks. But the spirit of the statement is true. Well, at least in your opinion. It's best to stick with the statement being both technically true and true in spirit. There may come a time when you have to choose between them. When in doubt, always go with technical truth. Your goal is to sway your audience, so sometimes it's best to go with the spirit of the statement. When you are making a statement that is true in spirit, but not in fact, it's best to make it clear it's not technically true. For example, you are a bad man. This may be true, but it's difficult to prove. But on the other hand, you are evil and vile and covered with fleas is definitely not true. It is clearly an insult. Any attempt to argue the statement itself is due to failure. Of course, he isn't covered with fleas. I'm really describing in hyperbole how you are the spawn of Satan and that nothing grows where you walk. I'm just saying. But the point of that is, by sticking with the spirit and making it clear that it's an insult, then you won't get stuck in minute details about an argument. It also means you should try your best not to get caught up in arguing insults. Insults are opinions. Opinions are never wrong. What I mean by that is, is if somebody has an opinion, that is their opinion. There's no point in trying to tell them, you don't have that opinion. You can tell them, well, I don't think you're giving somebody a fair shake, I don't think you have a right viewpoint on it, I think your viewpoint is highly subjective, I don't value your opinion. But telling somebody that their opinion is wrong is almost always doomed to failure, so it's best not to deal with that. On the other hand, sometimes you have to fight dirty, and that means break out the best insults you got. Because if that's the way you need to win, that's what you gotta do to win. Well. We have touched on a lot of topics here, and this looks like a good place to stop. I understand a number of the topics that I'm bringing up may be distasteful, but if you do not understand the weapons that are used against you, you will have no hope in protecting yourself. Up next, I hope to deal with deception, the fine art of lying while speaking only the truth, how to use it, and how to spot it. And after that would be aggression. Using insults, browbeating, and intimidation to win arguments, how to spot weaknesses in others, how to exploit them, when to use them, and how to protect yourself.